As we look ahead to the observance of the 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday in Selma, there's perhaps no more, no one more important for us to hear from than one who lived through the earliest days of nonviolent protest, who repeatedly put his life on the line for justice before the passage of the Civil Rights Act or the Voting Rights Act or any of the marches which led to their passage. A man then who went on to become an extraordinarily successful businessman, a general, a generous philanthropist, and an inspirational speaker and leader. Hank Thomas was born in 1941. He is an American civil rights activist and businessman and grew up in St. Augustine, Florida. He received a scholarship to Howard University, where in 1960, he helped to form the student arm of the civil rights movement as one of the founding members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, known as the SNCC. In 1961, he became one of the first freedom riders who rode buses to and in the South to test the South's refusal to obey rulings, making it illegal, the long-standing practice of segregating public buses. Hank Thomas's story is one of success by a man who was one of this country's civil rights foot soldiers. It is the story of a man who was sent to jail 22 times in a fight for civil rights. A man whose life nearly ended on a burning Greyhound bus. I believe that's one up in Anniston, Alabama, not far from here. A man who was delivered to a mob of Klansmen by the police to be lynched. A man who became a successful businessman and a generous philanthropist. It is a story of a man who served in the Vietnam War, was wounded, and received the Purple Heart. It is the story of a man who remains committed to the cause of justice. Today, as we honor America's most famous martyred civil rights hero. Please join me in welcoming another great hero, a living hero of both the historic struggle in the 60s and the ongoing challenging work that remains today. Please join me in welcoming freedom writer Hank Thomas. company may have gotten it wrong when they coined the jingle that the best thing about waking up is Folgers in your cup. <laughs> when you're 74 years old, the best thing about waking up is waking up. <laughs> I have been to the mountaintop. And I'd seen the promised land. God of our weary years. God of our silent tears. Got my hand on the gospel plow. Wouldn't give nothing for the journey now. Keep your eyes on the prize. For we shall overcome. I dreamed last night I saw Dr. King, alive as you and me. Says I, but Dr. King, you're many years dead. I never died, said he. Oh, that evil man, he shot you. He killed you, said I. Takes more than bullets to kill a dream, says Dr. King. I didn't die. Standing there before me, smiling with his eyes, said, Dr. King, what they will never kill will go on to organize from Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and the Carolinas, too, where oppressed peoples defend their rights. It is there that I'll be with you. Yes, my name is Hank Thomas. I'm a freedom fighter. I fought for the civil liberties of my people in these United States, and I fought for the right to be called and treated like a man. 
this is the 54th anniversary of the Freedom Ride and the 50th anniversary of the 1964 Civil Rights Bill. And that causes me to review even more some of our history and how we came to be and certainly how the African American students came to be in this room today. The Civil Rights Movement changed America. It opened up freedom for waves of people who were disenfranchised by pushing on the gates of freedom and, the, and on the race issue. This movement liberated all groups of people crossing all racial lines, sexual, and gender lines. Dr. King said it best when he stated that this movement proved that the race issue is both at the heart and the promise of this great nation. I'm one of the 13 original Freedom Riders and I have known rivers. I have known rivers as ancient as the world and older than the flow of human blood in human veins. And my soul has grown deep like the rivers. Various events of late, verdicts and recent trials, lacks of indictments, laws that have limited voting rights, and immigration rhetoric, workers' rights issues and sometime more aggressive recruitment by the KKK. All of these things re reaffirms for us that we have come today a long ways in this country, but not quite all the way. The struggle for all men and women to exercise rights inherent in the U.S. Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, or the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, regardless of one's race, sex, or sexual preferences, and the absence of living in fear, not being misunderstood or mislabeled, the right to wear a hoodie, or to listen to loud rap music and not be labeled a gangster and be killed because somebody thought that you may have a gun. The struggles for diverse people for poor citizenship and treatment sadly sometimes remain an elusive dream for some of us. And sadder still knowing that the rights for freedom has neither a beginning or an end. That it is as much an evolution as it is a revolution. The Civil Rights Movement brought about many changes to unjust laws. Yesterday, we fought for the right to vote. 50 years ago in Mississippi, we fought for the right to vote. But today, voter suppression is our rallying cry. I have known Rivers. A casual glance at my rap sheet of 22 arrests, one could easily conclude that I am a career criminal. And to the dismay of my mother, I am. <laughs> I was a criminal charged with treason against the state of Mississippi. I was an outlaw wanted by the state of Alabama for being an outside agitator coming in to stir up the Negroes. I was a catalyst for social change. I also know that gains won on the battlefield can sometimes be fleeting. We all know that freedoms that are hard won 
can sometimes be lost. And each generation must continue the fight lest we lose some of the ground that we have gained. I am in my 74th year and I am proud of my generation and the role that it played in changing this country. Especially changing or discharging bad laws, unjust laws. The unjust laws of segregation and racial discrimination. The stand your ground law is a bad law and it must be overturned. That is a bad law. Just as my generation challenged and changed the bad laws, the bad laws of segregation, you must do the same thing, my friend, for these unjust laws that we have today. There remains much to be done, and I have known rivers. I am a Buffalo soldier. I served with valor in the Vietnam conflict, and as previously stated, I earned battlefield medals and the Purple Heart for the injuries that I sustained on the battlefield. I fought for the rights and liberties of others while I did not enjoy those same rights right here in LaGrange, in Georgia, and in the South. I am the history of my people. In 1864, when the ex-slave laborers who made up the Massachusetts 54th Colored Reg Regiment, and when they made their heroic charge at Fort Wagner, South Carolina, I was there. In my heart and soul, I am a member of the 54th Colored Regiment colored regiment. In 1943, the Tuskegee Airmen, the Tuskegee Airmen, those black airmen who never lost a bomber to German fighters. I was there. I am a Tuskegee Airman. And when the all black 761st tank battalion who were attached to General Patton's army who first crossed into Germany and who helped rescue the soldiers in the Battle of the Bulge. I was there. And the 92nd Infantry, the modern day Buffalo soldiers, who produced four Medal of Honors in, the, in Italy during World War II. I am a Buffalo soldier. I was there. I am my people's history, their pain, and their joy. When I boarded that bus, that Greyhound bus in May of 1964, like the 54, like the Tuskegee Airmen, like the 761st Tank Battalion, and like the 92nd Infantry, this descendant of ex-slave laborers was fighting for freedom and for the liberty of our people. I could not vote, be served in a restaurant here in LaGrange, or rent a hotel anywhere throughout the South. However, like my father and his father before him, when I received my draft notice, I reported to serve my country. I answered my country's call, and I left blood, sweat, and tears on the ground in Vietnam. And those tears were for my three medics who were killed there, 18 and 19 years old, and two the 18-year-old the medics were killed on the same day. But that was then, and this is now. And the world has turned over many times in my 74 years. 
I have traveled far and wide. Yes, the country has changed. My, my, how it has changed. Today, yes, today, I too am proud to be in America. I am proud to be an American. And I have never been more proud of my country than that night in 2008. I spent the first 20 years of my living, of my life living under the apartheid system in this country called segregation. But today, but today, Lord, oh Lord, stony the road we have trod, and bitter has been that chest and rod. And it was built in the days when hope yet unborn had died. But with a steady beat, did not our weary feet bring us to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, where Barack and Michelle Obama just <laughs> reside. When John Kennedy was elected president, the Irish and Irish Catholics rejoiced and were proud, and proud they should have been. And when a woman, when a woman is elected president of these United States, y'all gonna rejoice. <laughs> One day in the future, a Jew or a Hispanic will be president of these United States. And I pray that no one will question their citizenship or their religion or ask to see their birth certificate or information Are you hearing me, Donald Trump? In my lifetime, I have voted for Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, and Reagan. I have voted for Carter, Bush 1 and 2, and I voted for Clinton. But I am proudest, don't hold it against me now, I am proudest to have voted for a man who looks like me, Barack Hussein Obama. I am proud that my country elected a man of that diverse parentage to be president. And since that election night in 2008, I can truly say America the beautiful. Since that known November night, I can sing with America, my country, tears of thee. And yes, since that night, I can say I am too proud of my country. Some people say that President Obama is a polarizing figure. Polarizing. Throughout the history of this country, and you know it here in LaGrange, and you know it here in LaGrange College, throughout the history of our country, any time an African American has moved into an area that has been previously preserved for whites, they say that that individual is polarizing. 1928, Cadet B.O. Davis enters West Point. He was the first black cadet in West Point in the 20th century. When it happened, the majority race cadets all took a vow, an oath, that no one would speak to him during the entire time that he was there, and history records that to a man they kept their word. 1942, General B.O. Davis becomes the commander of the famed Tuskegee Airmen. He rose above that treatment from his fellow Americans. But while he was there, they said that he was a polarizing figure. 1947, Jackie Robinson integrates Major League Baseball, and he catches hell from all of the white players they cheered, and they hoped that he would fail. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. I hope he fails. Jackie Robinson, to many, was a polarizing figure. 
1948, President Truman signs an executive order stating that all men and women of the armed forces would be treated equally. And for the first time, black and white military men and women received the same pay for the same right. To many, the president's order polarized the armed forces. 1954, Brown versus Board of Education, for equal opportunity for education, it polarized the South. 1956, on the Montgomery bus boycott, they said that Rosa Parks, by refusing to give up her seat to a white man, became a polarizing figure. 1957, the desegregation of the public schools Six-year-olds in New Orleans became polarizing figures. And in 1960, at Greensboro A&T College, four students sat at the lunch counter. They were not served because they were black. They were not served because they were polarizing figures. And in 1962, James Meredith enrolled at Ole Miss Two people were killed in the mobs that formed there. Again, James Meredith, it is said, was a polarizing figure. And in 1961, 13 people, including yours truly, boarded a Greyhound bus and headed south. Blacks and whites sitting together. The 1961 Freedom Riders it became a turning point against state-mandated racism. The fight, our fight for human and civil rights that led, and it was led, by an integrated army. Young people today, you need to know it was blacks and whites fighting together that particular evil. In 1964, Mississippi Freedom Summer. In Mississippi in 1964, 90% of all of the blacks who were eligible to vote in Mississippi could not vote. Medgar Evers was a decorated Army vet. When he came back to Mississippi, he was not allowed to vote. And he was assassinated because of his efforts to exercise the freedoms that he fought to give European. He wanted those freedoms for his people, and he was killed for it. 1964, hundreds of students, blacks and whites, from the North and the Midwest, traveled to Mississippi to help register blacks to vote. And during that summer, you know the history. Three civil rights workers were murdered. And during the entire summer, a total of 30 people were murdered. One minister <coughs> went to the courthouse in Belzoni, Mississippi, simply to inquire about the process of registering the vote and he was shot dead on the steps of the courthouse as he left. In Mississippi, and during the time of the Civil Rights Movement, this is something that is not widely known, so I'm going to depart from my text just for a few minutes and speak to you about it. In the World War II, the headlines read, the Allies defeat Germany. The Allies defeat the Nazis. Wasn't this the US or Great Britain or France? It was the Allies. My friends, we had allies in our fight for freedom and justice in this country. Whites of goodwill, 
stood with us, marched with us, fought with us. And there is one group that I want to tell you about who proved to be our most steadfast compadres. The first time I ever walked a picket line, washed outside of Washington, D.C., 80% of the people on that picket line that walked with me protesting racism were Jews. Two of the people walking on that picket line were Holocaust survivors. Showed me their tattoos. They had survived Auschwitz. And dear, 19 years later, these be people who were scheduled to be put to death because they were Jews were walking on a picket line defending my rights. We owe a special thanks. And this gracious, grateful Gentile say to the Jews, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, America. You walked with us. You stood with us. And in the case of the two Jews who died with chain, you died with us lest I forget thee, O Jerusalem. 1965, Selma to Montgomery March via the Edmund Pettus Bridge, whose anniversary we will celebrate in March. Congressman John Lewis and hundreds of others were beaten by horse-mounted state, state troops as they attempted to cross that bridge. And now, 50 years later, waiting to greet them at the other end of the bridge will be an American president by the name of Barack Obama. <laughs> yes, I've seen rivers, and my soul has grown deep like those rivers. And let me apologize to you, lest I sound a little bit jingoistic, Today, you and I live in a wonderful country. The actions, or better, the failure of uh, the actions of Congress notwithstanding. My experience in civil rights movement left me with a great resolve. I heeded the military mantra to be all that you can be. I have climbed the mountains, and I have reached for the stars. Though I was born in poverty, I never believed that I was destined to be poor. Yes, I grew up without a lot, but I never let that define me. I never owned poverty, and it never owned me. And yet, as the world turned, not all is well in parts of America. Just as Dickens wrote, it is the best of times, and unfortunately for a few of our citizens, it is the worst of times. Today, some 50 years after the civil rights, human rights movement, and hundreds of diverse elected officials, there are still parts of our community in crisis. And the political system alone will not solve those problems. We all got to be a part of that solution. And yes, there are two Americas. In one America, the stock market has peaked at 18,000. The automobile industry, after near collapse in 2009, is more profitable than ever. Job creation in the last four years has exceeded that of 10 years. And home ownership of people of color has increased even though some have gone through the mortgage crisis. And notwithstanding all of this, and the high times that we, many of us, enjoy. In another part of America, children go to bed undernourished. The high school dropout rates are escalating for people of color. Too many African American males populate our jails and prisons. Working and professional class people have lost jobs and lost homes, and unfortunately, too many have lost hope. And the widening gap between the haves and the have-nots 
We believe this country is better than this. Today, the world over, people understand that the USA is the land of opportunity. Get to the USA and your dreams will come true. You and I live in a country that was built by and continued to be propelled by the energies and talents of her first and second generation of immigrants. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. And like the immigrants from the West Indies and Africa, I too have come to the new America. And I have made my dreams come true. And I hope you will too. Whether from Asia, Europe, South or Central America, or Africa, people risk their lives to get here. You are already here. What will your legacy be? We have a charge to keep, a God to glorify. We must protect the rights of all people, whether they are people of color, women, diverse sexual orientation, or religion. We must protect the rights of all people. In the words of Dr. King, now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. For it would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency of now to serve the present age. Mother's Day, 1961, will live in infamy in my mind. Seven black, six white freedom riders, along with 11 other unsuspected passengers, were almost murdered by the terrorist group called the KKK in Anniston, Alabama. But just days before that, I was arrested in Winsboro, South Carolina for attempting to use the, quote, whites only restroom. I was taken to jail and later that evening, the police took me out of jail and delivered me to a waiting clan mob. As we neared the closed bus station that night, and the police stopped maybe a block away from the station, and they said, you can go now. And I looked at that mob of men, and I saw no lights at the bus station, and I said, the bus station is closed. And when will the next bus come? He said, we don't know. I said, well, you can't put me out here. These people will, will beat me up. <coughs> there were three police officers. Two were in the front seat. And one was in the back seat with me. He put his hand on his gun and said, get out of this car. And I said, you can't. You can't put me out here. He said, you get out of this car, I will blow your brains out. In a few seconds, I had to make a quick decision. I believed that police officer would have done that. I thought if I got out, I had a halfway decent chance of outrunning that mob. But where was I going to run? So I remember the lines of a joke that was told many, many years ago. When I got out of that car, I said, feet, don't fail me now. <laughs> I'm here to tell you that Usain Bolt couldn't have caught me. <laughs> but where was I going to run? I was in pretty good athletic shape, but where was I going to run? So I started running. And I don't know if I said a prayer at that particular time. But years later, I remember the refrain from a song that stated, the Lord may not come when you want him to, but he'll come when you need him. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, a 
man drove up beside me as I was running. He said, son, jump in this car and get down on the floor and don't get up. This man was an African-American who was a veteran of World War II who had been paralyzed by a German bullet. And I got in that car expecting to hear the bullets coming through the back window at any time. That is how I escaped from Winsboro, South Carolina, later on this year in a few minutes. And after 54 years, in a few months, I'll be going back to Winsboro. And I'll be taking a message of reconciliation, and I'll be telling them what a mighty God we serve. Yeah. I will not go back to Winsboro with malice or any maliciousness in my heart. But I'd like to meet some of those men and just say, the Lord has blessed me and I hope he has blessed you too. I rejoined the writers in Atlanta, Georgia, where we were prepared to go into Anderson. Anderson and Birmingham. But two of those writers were not able to continue with us, James Peck and John Lewis, they had been severely beaten in Rock Hill, South Carolina, and they were unable to continue. Dr. King and other veteran civil rights activists tried to dissuade us from going into Anderson and Birmingham because they knew of the viciousness and the hatred that existed in those places. But we were dreamers, and we were daring. So we rode into the eye of the tiger, into the cities noted for its hotbed of Klan activity. As we rode into Anderson, the streets were deserted. Apparently, the local police had said to the citizen, stay off the streets and let us handle it. And as the bus pulled into the bus station, we did not see any police. We saw probably 30 or 40 men yelling and screaming, rejoicing that the bus had come. And the bus driver, I'm sure, fearing for his life, knew he needed to get off of that bus. And he opened the door and he said, fellas, listen, all I did was to drive the bus and I brought him to you. But he saved us. Because before he got off the bus, he fixed the door so it could only be opened from the inside. So he saved us because the crowd couldn't get on the bus. They started breaking out the windows, lead pipes, baseball bats. We were probably only there for about a half an hour. Obviously, we were very afraid and just about every window had been broken, but they still could not get aboard the bus. We learned later on that somebody had called Robert Kennedy in the Justice Department and he prevailed upon the president of Greyhound because none of the bus drivers would drive, us, drive the bus out. And so a bus driver came aboard. And as he tried to drive away, about three pickup trucks were in front of the bus so that he could only drive maybe 10, 15 miles an hour and as I looked through the rear window, there must have been 10, 15 cars behind us. So as we were moving along slowly, and looked like maybe a half an hour, half a mile from the bus station, we could hear the flip, flip, flop of a flat tire. They had cut the tires. And so maybe a few miles outside of Anderson, the tire of the bus went completely flat. Just by coincidence, it stopped in front of a country store where once again, there were about 40 or 50 people who looked like just come back from Sunday church. They had their children with us, on with them, boys on the shoulders of their dads. They were there to watch the Freedom Riders 
get beat up. And again, the bus driver, fearing for his life, got off the bus, but he locked the door. And when the mob finished breaking out the remainder of the doors and they still could not get aboard, that's when they set the bus afire. We are told that it was an incendiary grenade that was thrown aboard the bus in the rear window. We are broken out window. And in just a few seconds, the bus was on fire. One of the Freedom Riders, who was a retired military man, said, get down on the floor. That is the only place you can find some air. And so we did. But that only lasted for a matter of seconds. And now the bus is completely filled up with smoke. I could hear them outside. I knew if I went outside, I would surely be killed by that mob. But if I stayed on that bus, Within a matter of minutes, either the smoke is going to kill me or the flames from the bus. At the age of 19, I had to make a decision on how I was going to die on that particular day. And ladies and gentlemen, on that particular day, I decided to commit suicide. I thought that if I breathed in that toxic smoke, took a deep breath of that toxic smoke, it would put me to sleep and that was the way I was going to die. But when you breathe in toxic smoke, it is suffocating. And no matter what your plans were, you fight to get some air. So as I got up and I made the dash toward the door and the folks behind me began to follow the people outside, so say, hey, they're trying to get out. They're trying to get out. Let's burn them niggas alive. They rushed up to the door, I think it was three men, and they held the door. So I couldn't open the door. As hard as I pushed and knocked against that, I could not open the door. And it's only going to be a few more seconds before I would be over, all of us would be overcome with, with, uh, from the smoke. And God Almighty, once again, he must have been looking down and he told his angel, my children are in trouble. We got to do something. And at that moment, the flames that started in the back reached the fuel tank. And they, it blew out the fuel tank in the back, and everybody outside ran. That was the way we were able to get out of it. But they weren't through with us. We got out of the bus and we're good at them and the bus is fully involved now. A man came up to me and I'm having trouble breathing. He said, boy, are you all right? And I nodded my head and the next thing I know, I was on the ground. He hit me with a baseball bat. Ambulances were called. White ambulance drivers refused to take us to the hospital. There was a law in Alabama. I'm pretty sure a law was similar to that in Georgia. White ambulance drivers cannot take black people to the hospital or render medical aid. State patrol officers was there. They did nothing. And so when the mob of men, three or four of them, came at me again after I struggled to my feet, and I saw the police officer was not going to do anything, Foolishly, I ran behind him and used him as a shield. That's a death, that was a death sentence, my friend. You put your hands on a white police officer back then, you just committed suicide. He pulled his gun, and I thought he was about to shoot me. And for whatever reason, I put my hand in front of my face there's a picture of me as he turned and he fired his pistol in the air. He said, all right, y'all had your fun now. Leave him alone. We were then able to get to the hospital and the mob followed us to the hospital. We got to the hospital and the hospital officials said, we can treat the whites here, but the blacks have got to go around to the other waiting room. White brothers and sisters said, if you don't treat them, then don't treat us. That was America. 
That was the South. It wasn't Nazi Germany. It wasn't uh, communist Russia. It wasn't the Ukraine. That was America 50 some years ago. Finally, we were able to get out of that hospital when Robert Kennedy prevailed upon Governor Patterson to get the state patrol to provide protection of Fred Shellsworth and three other carloads of cars to come and get us from Anderson. And that was the way we escaped from the mob in Anderson. And I tell you that not to make your brow heavy and sad, but for you to see what a mighty, mighty long ways we have come in this country today. When I boarded that bus 50 something years ago, I was in search of the American dream. My elusive American dream, the, the dream that stated that all men are created equal and that all men are due dignity and respect. Today I can tell you that that dream of old has not been tarnished. It has lost neither tone nor tint. And it stands a glimmering through the veils of yesteryear. That dream, it waxes a wondrous beauty. One that has been coaxed by smiles and watered by the tears of joy and triumph. Again, of the 13 original Freedom Riders, only three of us are still alive today. I have attended many funerals, and I have raised my glasses to their memories. For memories are all that I have left of them now. And memories, they don't believe really like people do. They always stay with you. It is in the evening of my memories that I visit some familiar places. Anderson, Birmingham, Montgomery, Selma, Lord, Lord Selma. And always my memories take me back to my hometown of St. Augustine and to the prison farm of Jackson, Mississippi. And sometimes I listen vainly and I hear some of the refrains from some of those old freedom songs, the music of my youth. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. Keep your eyes on the prize. And the song that has become the music of hope of oppressed peoples throughout the world, we shall overcome. 1961, I was in the springtime of my life. My music was still in me, and my song was yet to be sung yesterday. Yesterday, I was young. The taste of life was as sweet as honey upon my tongue. But today, today, I am a man in full. I'm a man who is deep in the order of his years. And today, my steps are slowed. They are illuminated by the dimming light of my approaching sunset. I know my twilight is here because I see the lengthening 
of my evening shadow. The thousand dreams I dream, the splendid things I plan. I run so fast that time and youth for me is running out. So when it comes, my friends, when it comes time for me to meet my day, and when I have to cross that river, and I must go dance with my ancestors of the Middle Passage, when I am summoned to come before the village elders to give accounts of my time here on earth, I will recite for them Second Timothy. I will tell them I fought the good fight, that I completed my course, and I kept the faith. And when they ask me why and for what reasons was I arrested some 22 times, and when they ask me why and for what reason that I was sentenced to six months in the Mississippi State Penitentiary and during that time put in solitary confinement two different times. And when they ask me, why did I do all of this? I will tell them, and speaking in the vernacular, the bucolic vernacular of my great grandfather, I simply say to him, I've seen something wrong, and I've done something about it. Thank you. talking to you in a little bit, but we do have Mr. Thomas here, and he really has shared with me that he looks forward to the opportunity to have an exchange with you and to answer any questions. So why don't we take just a, just a few minutes and have maybe two, maybe three questions um, that any of you would like to ask him and, and have his response. We have a microphone on this side. I'm going to move this one over as well. So if you come to the microphone, ask a question so everybody can hear. That requires another degree of bravery. I think we've heard about some bravery. You can be brave enough to come to the microphone. So, uh, floor is open. So come on up and ask a question. Uh, good evening or good morning, everyone. <laughs> um, I guess my question is, how do you think that, or why do you think that the mindset of what was then the time that you grew up in? And even that, how did it last and survive to even now? Because we still witness some of the stuff that you witnessed when you were growing up. So, like, how do you, or why do you feel like that mindset is still surviving? As a young person, I want you to understand, and for all of you, this is a much different country than what it was 50 years ago. Have we really e re uh, erased all? prejudice in the minds of those, all racism? No. A German today can, I mean, a Jew today can go to Germany. They're not going to put him on a train east to a concentration camp. But is there anti-Semitism in Germany still today? Yes, there is. There's anti-Semitism in France today. Yes, there is. And there are still, we've come a long ways, but we haven't gotten, we still have a little bit to go. So there is still some problems that we have today as evident by some of the events in the last uh, uh, few months. But the country has changed and it's going to be up to you and to you 
to continue to make it change and evolve. Okay. Thank you. sit down on a plane or you're sitting someplace and the minute I will turn and say hey hi how are you doing I can see the relief that comes over that white person's face mm -hmm. gee whiz I opened the door for them to talk and we talk and it's not always about sports because <laughs> <laughs> I was a lousy football player and okay, I don't want to talk about that so the question is and really Say this to the black folks. It is sometimes the unfair burden on the part of those who have been victims to start the healing process. That's just the way it is. So why don't you start talking with your white classmates? Find something that you all agree about. Don't put people on the defensive because none of you were here 50 something years ago and you weren't in that mob or stoned at the bus. So I don't need to beat you over the head with that. But it is an issue and I think the beginning or the solution is that we start talking with each other. Give me an example, down in Mississippi, of all places, Mississippi, every 
year, the governor of Mississippi has what he calls a prayer breakfast. It doesn't matter if the governor is Republican or Democrat. And one of the things they do at the convention center, they ask people to sit at a table with members of the other race and just talk. They have exchange of converse, exchange of congregation or ministry and this type of thing. See, Mississippi, at least this particular organization, understand what happened many years ago. And they want to make sure that we start the healing process. So I'm going to put some of the burdens on the black students and start talking with the white counterpart. You would be surprised how relieved they will be because they don't know what to say. And the reason they don't know what to say is because I'm going to blame cable news and all of the talking heads because the only way they can get ratings is to keep some stuff going. Oh, keep stuff going. And this is what happens a lot of times. But talking to each other, talking with each other, it'll do a lot of good. Yeah. It looks like we got we got two folks in line to ask questions. If y'all can do this as briefly as you can, then we're going to let you do that. We're going to let you do that, and then that, that'll be the end of our formal time together. And I'll close this with a prayer. So, two more. Good afternoon, my name is Dean Torres. Um, I just want to say thank you for coming today and speaking to us. My first question is, uh, who is your greatest mentor in all of this? My greatest mentor? Obviously, uh, I admired Dr. King greatly. <coughs> Booker T. Washington was one of my mentors. And uh, I admire anyone who tried to bridge the gap communication between people. These are the people that I admire. Booker T. Washington is certainly one of them. Dr. Benjamin Mays Morehouse College uh, was one of them. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for your speech. It was absolutely amazing. Thank you. Um, I just wondered if your faith was instilled from you in you from the get-go, and if it wasn't for your faith, if you would have been able to lead things so peacefully, so to speak. My mother, I have her DNA, and my mother is 93 years old. And the old girl is still kicking high. <laughs> I have never heard my mother say a bad thing about anyone. Me, this is funny. We'll give me an example. We, this is many years ago, sitting in our house and watching television. And a man goes in to rob a bank. This is a television movie. And she says, oh, I wish he would take that money back. <laughs> he, he shouldn't have. If he'll just take them. I said, Mother, it's a movie. <laughs> I know, but he just should take the money back and, and everything will be all right. My mother is the eternal optimist, and she believes that every one of God's children is capable of doing something good. She doesn't hold grudges. And I've shared with some people that sometimes I get angry with myself because I have that same gene in me. Sometimes I, I want to get mad, and I want to, you know, I want, I want revenge and this type of thing, but it can't happen. I can't do that. <coughs> It's my mother. Okay. <laughs>